All right, guys. Um, this is gonna be like uh, I would say the well, it is the second half um, of our coverage of the Renaissance um, because there is a lot to cover. You can't just do it in one lesson. So last lesson was kind of giving you the foundation of things. Um, this lesson is looking more particularly at the works that came out of um, those ideals and um, how they affected culture, of course, which we've already been really talking about. So humanism, right, um, is one of the biggest changes um, in basically human, I say insight, but human conduct, I guess, ever, you know, for like 800 years coming out of the Middle Ages, uh, a heavy focus on being a better individual, being a more uh, educated individual. Um, so again, basically studying these classics um, from Greece and Rome uh, who came before them. So what they started to realize the Greeks and Romans were doing, uh, since they felt that the Greeks and Romans had such you know, successful civilizations before them, they basically tried to mimic or copy. Um, so a lot of the old, you know, um, Greek and Roman writings had certain languages and certain ways of using that languages. And a lot of these Renaissance writers and um, writers, or uh, yeah, people, I keep saying writers, <laughs> are going to use similar types of what they call vernacular. All right, but we'll come back to that. All right, so humanism, uh, again, is largely rooted on education. So what areas do humans at that time believe you should be better skilled in to be a better human, right? Um, because why do you think, you know, you're sitting here doing this right now, right? We're trying to create a better society by having a more educated population. So humanists, uh, very heavy study of grammar, because remember Castiglione, you have to be fluent, you have to be... Um, good with language and communication. Uh, rhetoric, which is the same deal. It's, it's like grammar and English, basically, what you do in English class. Poetry, same thing. Moral philosophy, what's right and wrong, right? I mean, isn't, isn't that what the guiding thing is to all civilization, right? That should be the answers uh, that we're all trying to find all the time. You know, what's right, what's wrong, and why? Um, and history, because again, guys, um, I know you guys might not think maybe history is not too important or maybe it's not real interesting, but you, if you don't understand how people did it before, how should you know? How can you know how to do it now, or how not to do it now? Right? If you don't agree with how they did it back then, I mean, history is huge and you use it all the time and you don't even realize it. You know, so being a good historian is being a good thinker, right? Being able to analyze and compare and and make sound decisions based on sound evidence. That's what a historian is. It's not memorizing just a bunch of dates and facts, you know, and people. Um, but anyway, I'm getting at myself. So uh, Petrarch is considered to be the father of humanism, uh, or humanists, I should say. So make sure you remember that. That's definitely on the quiz. So he believed that people who were educated have a duty to live an active civic life and put their study of what they've learned to the state service. So basically, work for your state, right? Uh, contribute to the growth and health of your state instead of, I don't know, just looking out for yourself, right? And, and maybe, I don't know, robbing from people or, you know, doing trade deals with other countries to make yourself rich and everyone else poor around, you know, things like that. But, you know, help your country, uh, that's why you guys are here. Um, that's why we're doing this. All right. So since they were learning so much from old writing, uh, again, a lot of these Italian Renaissance uh, artists and liter uh, liter literaturists uh, started to develop their own ways of writing uh, based on what they learned. So some of the stuff that we hold to today, like, for example, our view, our version of what... Uh, we view hell to be, right? Fire, the devil, you burn in your misery, right? For your eternity, right? Because he did really bad things while you were alive. That all comes from this guy, Dante. Before that, uh, there was no real view of hell. They knew there was somewhere you didn't want to go, but there was no like physical, you know, visualization of what it is or what it is not. 
that did not start until the Renaissance and these, um, you know, these uh, writers starting to focus on more like taboo subjects like heaven and hell. Uh, Chaucer is another one. Our modern English that you and I are speaking right now uh, comes from this guy, Chaucer. So we'll come back to that. So make sure you know Dante's book, because again, our, our view of what hell is and what, what it's made up of largely comes from this, the Divine Comedy um, that he wrote. Uh, so if you're ever interested in a good read, check it out. Um, it's really, I thought it was really good at least. Um, Chaucer, if you're in English class, you maybe have already read some of this. And if you haven't yet, you probably will at some point in your future. But the Canterbury Tales and the way that the English language is used in it becomes the basis for all modern English language. Um, obviously, you've read Shakespeare and stuff. You know English back then did not sound much like what it does today, right? Um, because the vernacular was different. But it starts to change um, with the Canterbury Tales and things like that. So make sure you know that one. Kristen de Pizan uh, mentioned her because in the Renaissance, again, women did not really have any, I don't know, rights or liberties. Um, they were always held to be inferior to men. Um, Kristen de Pizan starts to, you know, is one of the first real feminists and, um, I don't want to say first, but one of the first real recognized, um, feminists, especially in the Renaissance. Um, and she starts to basically develop this idea that a later guy named Descartes will take further, but the idea that women think the same way as men, right? They, they don't think differently, um, they can do the same tasks as men. So why should they not be offered the same educational opportunities and, you know, occupational op opportunities as men? You know, so that's an argument. This is like the 1400s, right, that we're talking about here with Kirsten de Pizan. So, you know, an argument for the next half a millennia, five, six hundred years. I mean, it's still an argument today, right? Okay. So I already said, the father of European humanism, make sure you know Petrarch, it's going to be very important, okay? So again, what did education look like then if it's so important, you know, to the Renaissance? And again, one thing I understand back then, education was for the rich, okay? You had to have money to pay the money, right, to, to uh, pay the taxes or at least to pay the private tuition for your son or daughter to go to school. It wasn't for everybody back then. That'll come, you know, later because of the Renaissance, but not yet. All right, so again, I keep telling you guys, the Renaissance was only for the wealthier aristocracy, nobility, those people. So what are they going to focus on learning? These people who are, you know, privileged enough and capable enough to be part of this Renaissance education movement. Um So liberal studies, which I'll go into more here. Well, it's right down there. What are liberal studies? Right? Like, well, what does that mean? Um, so down there, right? Liberal studies, I kind of went through this already. The study of history, which you still study today, right? Moral philosophy, which is like ethics or civics. We don't really have that in high school, but if you go to college, you're probably going to have that. Um, eloquence, that's more of like etiquette, how to conduct yourself how to dress, how to eat properly, you know, that sort of stuff. And again, that's, this is more for the rich people, okay? Uh, letters, again, letters are books, okay? Or at least that was their version of books because they didn't have the printing press yet. So you're reading, you know, pages of manuscripts, not bound books like we have today. Uh, math, of course, especially if you want to be an engineer or somebody's going to build stuff um, or even a, a, a painter or sculptor. Architect, yeah, astronomer, astronomy, because that was very important to navigation and understanding, you know, uh, your position on the earth, of course. And music uh, actually became a little bit later, but became a major focus of study as well. So, phys ed, right? You're still in phys ed. Isn't it weird how your education today represents or resembles so much of what they started doing all the way back like 500, 600 years ago? Pretty crazy, isn't it? Um, so physical education back then, not what you're doing today, really. But same deal. You're out, you know, um, doing something physically with your classmates or peers. 
So back then, javelin throwing, because that was a big part of fighting back then as a warrior, um, archery, because um, I was, again, being part of war. Remember Castiglione, right? Have to be a good warrior, everybody. Uh, dancing, which is kind of, I don't know, I think maybe just more for the physical activity and fun. I don't really see any real purpose to it for society. Uh, wrestling, which, right, still exists today. I wrestled all my life since I was, what, seven years old till I was... 23, four years old in college. Um, so the goal of the humanist educators, they knew that, and like we know, you know, we don't expect you guys to be Einsteins, to be rocket scientists. Yeah, some of you probably will be, right? But more importantly, we want you to understand why, what's right or wrong in society, you know, and how to be a good citizen, how to contribute um, to your government in your country, you know, that's what, I mean, that's why you're doing this. And that's for me, the more important thing. But anyway, so humanist schools were the model for European education, right? You still hold to most of those things today. In the 1800s, things will change a little bit. They'll start adding like science, right? And um, other areas of growth that humans are starting to discover, but we'll get to that later. Okay. So, not, um, oh yeah, for today, one of your assignments uh, is going to be to identify the major uh, works of art that I provided to you back before Christmas, um, the proper artists for each of those on there, and their names as well. All right, so you might be saying, well, how am I going to do that? Well, they're all very popular pieces of Renaissance art. If you just search on Google a little bit, um, or even your textbook, most I think has most of them, you'll find them pretty easily. All right, but the three big ones, um, I always remember um, Ninja Turtles, right? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, all named after Renaissance artists. Leonardo, named after Leonardo da Vinci. Raphael, I can't remember Raphael's full name. And I can't remember Michael, Michelangelo's full name either. We just call them by their shorter versions, right? Because it's easier to remember. Donatello was an artist too, um, but not very popular, or at least as popular as those three. I know, poor Donatello, right? All right, so we're going to go a lot more into this. Um, let me see here. How much time do I got? I'll go one more slide, and then I'll pick up with art and stuff tomorrow, since that's going to be a focus for you. But um, So since humans at this time during the Renaissance are much more concerned with, you know, the physical world and what's going on around them, remember, secular worldview, and not as much religion anymore. Um, their arts, right, and the things that humans create are going to represent that. So again, middle-age art, as you've seen already if you watched the video um, that I posted before Christmas, uh, middle-age art had no, like, realism to it. It was very 2D, had no detail, had no depth, had no shading, because back then, humans didn't care about the human form or the physical world. Again, it was all spiritual. Because the physical world sucked back then. It was not a, not a fun life. You know, it was pretty miserable. Um, but yeah, in the Renaissance, life's getting better because people are starting to get wealth and be able to build things and make their lives better through the acquiring of wealth. So art becomes much more realistic. Art becomes much more detailed. Um, they start focusing more on you know, detail and the natural world around them in their art. Um, they're still, you know, we don't have frescoes here um, or even in Northern Europe because frescoes have to be done uh, where it's warm because they're ma mainly done with water paint, right? Water can freeze. So if it's below freezing or cold, like it is in a lot of Northern European areas, not, not going to happen. Why do you think Northern Europe developed oil painting, right? Oil does not freeze at 32 degrees, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, you're going to see a lot of nude depictions. You're going to see a lot of very, very anatomically um, correct sculpting and uh, paintings because that's what they were so interested in. And just so happens, they were so interested because that's what the Romans and Greeks were so much interested in. Remember, like... Um, I'm trying to remember, like, like Aristotle and Socrates and all them. They were, the same, they were interested in the same things. But during the Middle Ages, because there was no focus on education, all that stuff got lost. 
right? So basically the Renaissance, you're starting over again. You start. You have to relearn what they already had because it was lost during the Middle Ages. Okay, guys, we'll pick up there, um, or I'll pick up there in part two of the video. And otherwise, I'll see you in our Zoom meeting. All right, guys. If I can stop it. There you are.